Well, let's uh, turn back to God's Word in Exodus chapter 14, and we can read again at verse 13. Exodus 14 and verse 13. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Or you need only to be silent. To follow on a little bit from our children's talk this morning, I uh, remember when I turned 17 and was then able to drive or to begin uh, learning to drive, I was desperate to pass my driving test. And within a couple of months, I did pass it and went immediately to uh, purchase my first car with my father, which was a V-Reg Vauxhall Astra. And I just thought that I was king of the road. It didn't take me uh, very long though to get a little bit overconfident. Uh, I don't recall specifically uh, what debate I would have had, but uh, I do remember that any time uh, I was in the car with my mother, uh, I thought I had the absolute right and the privilege to critique and to criticize uh, any wrong move that she made while behind the wheel. I felt that I knew better, despite the fact she had been driving for at least 25 years. We all come to learn, eventually, that our parents know things that as their children we think they don't know we think that we know best but in fact they know a lot more than we do and perhaps as Christians we can be prone to think does God know what he's doing does he know what I am going through has he thought this one all the way through does he realize how difficult this situation and this providence is in my life? And perhaps this evening you are consumed with these thoughts. Or at least it is a thought in our heads. It is a prayer that we make. Perhaps the bad diagnosis that you or somebody else has. Or issues within your marriage, or within your family's structure, or within friendships at work, or in school. And we ask God, what is the purpose in all of this? We're in the heat of the battle. And we're wondering, where is he leading us? Where is he guiding us? Well, is it possible that God has seen the big picture and that we only see that tiny fragment? Is it possible that God knows exactly what he's doing? That God knows so much more than we do? Well, just have a think about all that God knew about the Israelites. He knew where they had been. He knew where he, he was going to lead them. He knew that the Israelites had been enslaved in Egypt. That they had been harshly treated under the rule of Pharaoh. But through God's man, through Moses, the Lord displays his dominating power and authority. And he brings them through these ten plagues. And he unleashes these ten plagues on the Egyptians. And he takes... Pharaoh to that point of submission and the Israelites are allowed to leave. I just want to retrace the steps in this passage. I want to notice these three, three key points. Faith, hopeless and love. I'm going to consider the verses that we read from verse 17 of chapter 13 to verse 14 of chapter 14. Faith hopeless and love. Well, first we consider the Israelites' faith. They needed faith for the expedition that they were about 
to embark on. It's interesting though, as a Christian, the world may question you and they may harass you and they may doubt you because of your faith. They see it as some mysterious crutch that you need to get you through life. Yet is it not true that your faith in God, it's not blind faith. It's not based on just wishful thinking. But God has ultimately opened our eyes. He has given us and he continues to give us assurances of our faith. God displayed his awesome uh, presence to the Israelites and to their en enemies in Egypt. Plague after plague, each escalating in severity. The Lord displayed just how powerful he is and that no other compares to him. As if this was not enough for Israel. As they set out on their journey to Canaan, again the Lord gives them in these verses at least two assurances of faith. We see it first of all in verse 19 of chapter 13. He gives them the assurance of Joseph's bones. How can somebody's bones be an assurance of faith? Well, back in, uh, at the end of Genesis, Joseph said to his brothers, which we kind of, he, he, re, he restates here in verse 19. He says, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. And then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. Joseph's faith, faith was remarkable. Why was it so remarkable? Because he said these words 400 years before it actually happened. Joseph knew that the Lord would, in the future, bring Israel to the promised land. And just as he had promised to Abraham, he wanted to be buried with his fathers too, not in Egypt. So for 400 years, Israel kept these remains of their father, Joseph. They kept them safe somewhere. They were certainly uh, in a location, in a place where Israel could go and access them and take them at the immediate uh, liberty to leave Egypt. And so as this future, picture the scene, as this future generation of Israelites 400 years after Joseph declared this desire to have his bones taken up out of this land this future generation are literally walking out of slavery and they are carrying these bones as a bold declaration which is clearly emphasizing to the whole nation of Israel and it's emphasizing to all those looking on that our God doesn't break his promises. They are a physical token of God's never failing fidelity and of his covenant commitment to his people. He gives them the assurance of faith in Joseph's bones. But then we see in verse 21, he also gives them another token of this cloud. By day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. So that they could travel by day or by night. By day it shows in the sunlight as a pillar of cloud. By night there was a fire that shone in it to lead them where they should go. Of course this was a great and obvious display of God's presence amongst the people. It ensures them that they will be led and that they will be guided by God alone where he sees fit to take them. However, it's not just a, a picture of God's presence, but in the Old Testament there is what we call uh, theophanies. There is God appearances. And we see later, he often appeared in the Old Testament in a cloud or in the fire. And later in the Old Testament, we'll see that the glory cloud or the Shekinah will rest upon the tabernacle. 
as the weight and the presence of God there. And likewise, here is God. Here is God present, but he is also revealing himself to his people to some extent. He is the very one who is going to guide them away from danger and into safety. It is Yahweh alone who is going to lead them out of slavery and bring them to an eternity of freedom. The cloud must have been a massive help to, to their leader Moses. It must have been so encouraging to have this presence of God, to have even this uh, theophany, this appearance of God before them, night and day. It must have been such an encouragement for the nation of Israel as they boldly are walking out with these bones of Joseph out of slavery after all of these years. This cloud that was sometimes moving them forward and other times it was making them stop and at other times it was moving them east or moving them west. And through the evening it was becoming or looking like a, a flame of fire so that they could travel by night. It must have kept the Israelites content every single day of these 40 years. I mean how could you grumble with such a wonderful and powerful and clear manifestation of God himself. And yet we know they grumbled. We know they complained. We've read of it even a few verses later. Perhaps we go down the line of thinking ourselves. That if God just revealed himself tangibly to me. If he was just a little bit clearer to me. If he, if he revealed himself like that in any day of my life. My situation would become so much easier in a moment. For the big decisions of my life I would know what career to do. I would know who to marry. I would know when to start a family. I would know in a moment if I was called to the ministry or to the mission field. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have God telling us where to go and when to do it? But don't you think that after two days or even two hours, Israel were saying, okay. It's time to move on. This cloud has been stopped here for ages. We need to get going. As we'll see in a moment when the Egyptians are coming. They would have been wanting that cloud to get going. To get them out of that situation. Or maybe they'll be saying to the cloud later in these 40 years. It's time to stop. We've been walking and walking and walking. Or when the cloud was leading them east and they wanted to go west. They would have questioned him. We don't have a pillar of cloud or fire today. We have the word of God. We have a scripture. And as Christians, his spirit is in us. Are we sensitive to the Holy Spirit? Prompting us and leading us and guiding us. And don't we already do this? When we know that the Lord is leading us somewhere when we know he is pulling on us to, to to do something for him to go and visit somebody to make that public profession of your faith in the church and you're trying to hold back and hold back we put up the barricade when God is chiseling away at our sinful character do we not fight against him it was Professor Janelle Mackay who wrote that the Lord does not always take his people by the route they expect. His wisdom and care transcend our human expectations. God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. We are familiar with 1 Corinthians 13 that these three remain, faith, hope and love. But as we saw and heard from our three titles and this evening, faith, hopeless and love. 
hopeless because we see Israel go into meltdown as we turn to chapter 14 and as it unfolds before us. As we noted, they were shown the cloud, they were shown where to go, but they did not know when that would be or where next the cloud was going to lead them. Ultimately, their destination was Canaan, the promised land. But in their own minds, they would have had some uh, local geography, I'm sure. And if you've ever seen a map of the, the Middle East, you can very quickly work it out yourself. But they would have known that if you're wanting to get to Canaan from Egypt, you go by the Via Maris, by the way of the sea, up the Mediterranean. And if you go that way, you'll get there in about two weeks. So I'm told. Well, it took them 40 years. I think any of us, even though we have very little uh, knowledge of that area, I'm sure we could have made it in less than 40 years. And so it actually raises quite a significant question. It was God who was leading them, wasn't it? So did he not know where he was going? Did God know every step that he was taking them? We say that he's leading us and guiding us, but why did it take 40 years when it could have taken two weeks? Was it even God that was in this cloud? Was this really an appearance of God? Well, believe it or not, this 40 year detour was a display of God's mercy for many more reasons, but at least this one. We saw from verse 17, God saw, said that although the coastal route is more direct, if we went that way, we're going to meet with the Philistines. Verse 17 in chapter 13, you're going to meet with the Philistines. And these Philistines, they're an army and they're ready to fight you. They're ready to enter into a war with you, Israel. And God knows that if Israel walked onto that battlefield, that they're they would immediately turn back and run to the prison of Egypt. Well, the Lord mercifully takes them on a longer route. He takes them on another path so that they, their lives are saved. But they didn't understand it at the time. We're very used to that feeling. But as we are noting this continual theme this evening, God knows exactly what he is doing in their life. Pastor uh, Kevin Dion, he, he notes what he calls himself uh, divine nevers. He says, do you realize all of the counterfactuals, the what ifs that never actually happened in your life? When we say things like, what if I had been on that plane? Or what if I had been in that car? Or what if I had never gone to that school? My life would have been so different. We don't think of the 10,000 things, he says, that the Lord does to us in his mercy by never doing them to us. Those of you who have uh, grown up in the church with a Christian family, there's a danger that you can feel like you've got a boring life. Or you've got a mundane testimony. Or you can feel like you've missed out on something. I remember having a, a debate with one of my friends, a Christian friend, who was trying to make the case for it's not so bad if a young individual, say, a 20-year-old Christian who's had zero experience of alcohol, if the Lord has never put that into their path, if that has never been a temptation for them. She was trying to make the case that if one night this individual has some alcohol and gets drunk on this evening, the thought process was that hopefully the individual has now seen how meaningless that life is and not want to take part in it anymore. She's trying to convince me that a little taste of the world is not all that bad if it brings you closer to God in the end. 
I said, that's terrible logic. I've seen far too many who have subconsciously, most of the time, or consciously adopted that logic. And they're now miles away from the church and miles away from God. Or at the very least, their consistency is flagging in regards to the church. They slip in and out of the church and they slip in and out of the world. Oh, taste and see that God is good. But don't be fooled that Satan wants you to taste and see that the world is so good too. As those brought up in a Christian home, Kevin DeYoung went on to say, We of all people ought to give thanks to God for all the messes we never even knew. That he's never put alcohol as a temptation into your life. We don't need to go chasing to see what it's all about. All of the things he never put in our lives. Simply because he gave us parents who took us to church. Or good friends or whatever it was. Think of all the things that never happened to you. And just like here. God is saying to Israel. You're, going up the way, you're not going to go up the way of the sea. The coastal route. Because even though you think that's better it is not. Israel are saying that's the shortest way. God says, I know, but I see things that you do not see. The first leg of this journey for Israel, it must have seemed like it was a terrible idea. Because God leads them to set up camp between the sea and the desert. As we entered into chapter 14. As they have the sea at their backs and Egypt at their front. They were like sitting ducks. If Egypt have a change of heart, if they decide that they're going to pursue Israel, then Israel are going to be pursued by the most powerful army on earth. We don't know how to fight, they say. Yet God says, this is exactly where I want you to be. This is where I want you to be. You don't understand. You don't know why I want you here, but I want you to trust me. I want you to have faith. God was setting a trap for foolish Pharaoh, wanting him to fall into it, wanting Egypt to be lured in. He wanted to reveal himself to them at least one more time, as if these ten plagues were not enough. As we sang in Psalm 106, even if it is the last thing that these Egyptians are going to do, as the Red Sea is flowing over their head, they are going to know that He is God. And that there is consequences for rebelling against God. That if we don't commit our life to Jesus, if we don't turn to our God, then we are setting ourselves against Him. And lo and behold, the trap has worked, as God knew that it would. Here's Israel, nowhere to go. The clouds don't move in. The oncoming Egyptian army are headed right in their direction. And how do Israel respond? They respond hopelessly. They don't think now about Joseph's bones. They're not thinking about the wonderful manifestation of God in the cloud. Instead, they panic and they complain. They would actually rather return as dead men to Egypt than trust in God who has set them free. And you know, Christian, you can be guilty of feeling like that as well. Fleeing. Fleeing back to the old life for the first sign of trouble. You want to give up because it's tough. And perhaps you, tonight you do feel That you're backed into that corner. You feel like you are between the rock and the hard place. That there is just darkness surrounding. That there is pressure from every side. That you don't even know what the next step is going to be. With diagnosis or family situations. Or financial worries. And you're wondering where is God in all of this. And you're waiting 
and you're waiting and you're waiting. Well, God sees you. God sees it. God sees every step you're going to take. He sees your next step. And he knows every step until your very last one. Because that last one is going to take you into the promised land. And he has promised to take us. And we know that our God never breaks his promises. He sees you and he is leading you. Faith, hopeless. Thirdly, love. In verse 13 and 14 of chapter 14, we see God's love. God responds through Moses with four different instructions. He says, fear not, stand firm, see, and be silent. Fear not. It's a common refrain. God has said the same thing to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob throughout Genesis. And now he's saying it to the whole of the nation of Israel. Don't be afraid. You have no reason to fear. And you see, it's a question of trust. Perhaps it's easy when everything is calm to be a Christian. When everything is going well. But when the illness comes or concern for your children or financial worries, what will be our response then? Will we trust? Will we believe? A verse I often come back to, which the Lord has spoken very clearly to me, is Isaiah 41.10. It's a promise and it's wonderful to hold on to the promises of God. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will help you, I will strengthen you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not. The second truth he gives them is stand firm. It can be easy to think that we need to do something in order to win the battle. But the victory has already been won. We are told to stand firm. But I was thinking, standing can actually be one of the hardest tasks that we do in our Christian life. You see, when you're zealous, when you're energetic, you just want to respond, you want to react impulsively. But the same goes for when we are mature in this life. When we have been through the waves, when we have been battered and bruised on every side, even standing is a task that takes its toll. But the wonderful promise which we saw on Wednesday evening, oh, but when we are weak, it is then that we are strong. It is not our strength, but the strength of the Lord. Fear not, stand firm, see. The Israelites were afraid when they saw the Egyptians coming. But God said, this is a good thing that you can see them. It means they've been lured in. It means that God is just about to display his power. He's saying to them, you can see the Egyptians now, but you will never see them again. It's hard at that moment when you see the difficulty coming in your life. When you see the enemy, we want to run and hide, we want to give in. But this is when we need to display our faith. You know, it's easy to talk the talk in our church building. But we need to walk the walk in the midst of our spiritual suffering. And lastly, be silent. God wants them to show their complete reliance on them and do absolutely nothing. Be still, be silent. The Lord will fight for you. Our natural instinct is to retaliate when somebody criticizes us, when we are insulted for our faith or for standing up for the truth. Well, the next time that happens, remind yourself of verse 14 of Exodus 14. The Lord will fight for you. 
you need only to be silent. Hindsight is a great thing. When we look back, we see clearly where God has led us. You know, it's a profitable exercise for us to do this evening as we go home. To just take stock of all the turns that you took, which you thought that were wrong. But God knew were right. You didn't know it at the time, but God did. And it all makes sense now. But looking forward is more difficult. Israel could see Joseph's bones. They could see the cloud night and day. They could look back and see how God has been faithful in the past. But right now in this moment, they had a decision to make. Are they going to trust? Or are they going to be afraid? Are they going to stand firm? Or are they going to run? You see, when God is guiding us, it's a journey of faith not a journey of sight. As we come to a conclusion, this connection was opened up to me, and let me just share it with you. Is there a link with this story of Exodus 14 and Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that was set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Did the author of Hebrews have in mind the echoes of this Old Testament story? You see, we don't have a cloud to gaze at anymore. We don't have a cloud to see anymore. But we have a Christ to fix our eyes on. Israel were glued to the pillar of the cloud. We must be glued to the cross of Jesus. Look at him. Look into Jesus. Look at him. See him. Listen to him. Know him. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Spend time in his word, learning about him. May others see you and say that she has been with Jesus. Well, you can't see into the future. And sometimes you can't even see that next step. But you can see Jesus. You can trust him. You know it's fitting to leave the story here at verse 14. As we were reading through, maybe you're desperate to get to that uh, the next few verses where we see Israel triumphantly walk through the Red Sea and Egypt are crushed. You know, it's fitting to leave the story here. Because it is here that most of us, if not all of us, live our lives every day. It is at this point that we stand and we must trust. We haven't yet seen the great Red Sea victory. But we are all too aware of the enemy's attack. And we are so often making the prayer of asking God, what is he going to do now? Well, he has taken you this far. And just like with Israel, he will take you all the way to the promised land. God sees you. God knows your situation. God is in control. Onward. To the prize before us. Soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall tread the streets of gold. Amen. Well, let's uh, conclude together by... Singing in Psalm 46 in the Sing Psalm, Psalm 46a. We'll sing from verse 7 to the end. The Lord Almighty is with us to strengthen and sustain for Jacob's God our strong defense and fortress. 
will remain. Psalm 46a on page 60 will stand and sing to God's praise. The Lord Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide in each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen.